The first reading for today comes from Psalm 118, verses 1 through 2, and then verses 19 through 29. Oh, give thanks to you, to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of God. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and, it, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. God, we have the question before us from your scripture, from the city of Jerusalem, the people who saw the spectacle, the people who were in chaos. Who is this? Speak to our hearts and minds this morning that we might come to celebrate Jesus in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus, who is that and what's with the hoopla? That's the name of my sermon this morning. Uh, if you've never heard the term hoopla, uh, it's lots of celebration and making ado about something. You see, our scripture tells uh, of Jesus entering Jerusalem. This is a passage and a story that many of us uh, have seen in Scripture. Maybe we've experienced, maybe we've learned it through all the years of sitting in church. 
It's a part of the gospel narrative that so many are familiar with, uh, even, if uh, even if your church attendance has uh, waned significantly in recent years. Maybe you remember it from a ch- being a child in church. Maybe you remember it from, from those occasions that you do attend. But Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem, and he's celebrated. Uh, not even a full week prior to him becoming crucified before he dies and then again is resurrected. And so the question then and the question we have now is who is this? Why is Jesus worth celebrating? And, And the historical answer for the time in that place the thing that they thought Jesus was, the person that they thought Jesus was, the answer to this question had a specific place in this history. You see, Jerusalem was a city of significance for the Hebrew people. It was not only a capital city, but it was the city uh, of David. David was a king, if you, if you uh, are, aren't that familiar. David was a king. Uh, I'd like to come a little closer to the camera. I hope that's all right with you all. And, and David was a king who was promised something in a covenant by God. He was promised that from his line, from his lineage, would come uh, a king whose reign would never end that it would be eternal, uh, and, and that it would be a good thing for the Hebrew people. Now, that promise was made to King David in the book 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 7 specifically. But if you read the rest of the Old Testament, uh, other parts of it, you'll understand that in terms of like David's physical son and his son's physical son, like that way that that line kind of got broken a little bit there was a time in which there was not a hebrew king on a throne in jerusalem but see jerusalem wasn't just a place for a king jerusalem was the place where where god was there was this temple that david had built his son Solomon made it spectacular, in which they, they believed that the presence of God was literally within it. Uh, and that the closer you were to that particular room and that particular temple, the closer you were to God, God's self. And the further you were away from that, the further you were from Jerusalem, the further you were from God. And so, when people understood later on that they were still anticipating some sort of return uh, of a Hebrew king, they were in this particular time looking for somebody that would free them from Roman oppression. And so when they say, Hosanna, this is the son of David, they're saying, hey, this guy's coming to sit on the throne. He's coming to free us, to rule us as one of our own people. That's who they thought they were celebrating. And while we do acknowledge that Jesus is a king and and was the king there entering a holy city, He would take the throne in a very different way, and the throne would not be what we would think it was. He took the throne over all of life by facing death on a cross and then raising from that death, overcoming even that, and then ascending to heaven to be with God, but not leaving us behind. The Holy Spirit was here with us. 
and it is with us here today. And so Jesus was celebrated. They thought that he was going to do certain things for them. They thought that the Roman soldiers walking their streets would be gone. And he didn't quite do that. And so they celebrated what they thought they wanted. They celebrated what they thought they needed. And it occurs to me that uh, right now in our world, we might be looking for Jesus to be something that maybe he's not. Jesus isn't a vaccine. Jesus isn't going to snap fingers and end a shelter-in-place order. That's, that's not exactly what, what was going on there, and that's not what, what's going on here either. The, whatever physical need that we think that we have, whatever singular place in our life that we feel like we're lacking, Jesus isn't that small or simple. But Jesus is far greater than those things. You see, Jesus is God, God's self, coming in humility to the earth, not only to be with people, but to show them that they should not fear. That they should... They, they should celebrate that God is with them even when they turn their back. Jesus is so many things. And whatever you can name Jesus as, he's even greater than that. You know, some people are looking for different answers to the problems we face today. Some are saying that if, if we just had this, or if we just had that, or if we just had... Some are celebrating one political leader or another political leader or, or, or blaming one person or another, and that's not it. Jesus isn't any of those people. So who is he? What does it mean to celebrate Jesus? What does it mean to celebrate a Savior? What does it mean to be saved in this instance? As I've watched and read some news uh, over the past weeks, I, I constantly am reminded of our humanity. I'm reminded uh, that this world is beyond our control. I'm reminded that this world is beyond beyond the amount of brokenness that I th thought was there. Uh, I've, I've learned about myself, I've learned about my family, I've learned about our neighbors. I, I've learned so many things, but, but I keep coming back to this one thing that, it, that I find particularly impactful at this time, and it's it's a line from our liturgy for funerals. As you hear of people who are going into hospitals and not coming out, as you hear stories of not being able to visit a loved one, or maybe that's your current reality. Maybe somebody that you love has gone to the hospital and you can't visit them. It breaks our hearts to not be able to be there. But what do we have? What, 
What can we rest on? What can we rely on in this time? And that line from liturgy says, in life, in death, and in life beyond death, God is with us. The story of Jesus, the celebration of Jesus is the celebration of that very fact. That God who created all things, who created the whole world, all that is good, who created you, cares so deeply about you, cares so deeply about those that you love, that God, God's self, would come to be with us. In the garden, after Adam and Eve ate, and they hid, God looked for them. In the time of Jesus, where people were looking all sorts of different ways and places for an answer, God was with them. And even now, in whatever broken place we find ourselves. Whether you see that the brokenness is with everything else around you or whether you put that blame on yourself and feel worthless, God says to you and says to that instance that you are loved and worthy enough to be with. Last week I spoke on one of my favorite books of the Bible, Rome, chapters of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, and I didn't even touch, I didn't even touch on the part that says there is nothing that separates us from the love of God. Nothing. Coronavirus, COVID-19, does not separate you from God. Being laid off, being scared about your bills or your budget does not separate you from God. I I spoke that 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 chapter says that, that we are given a spirit of adoption which we get to call God our Father or our Dad. For some, the image of a dad is not a great one. But in those instances, I encourage you to imagine a loving parent. God is that loving parent that created you, that no matter what you've done wrong, no matter how many times you've colored on the wall or, or, or thrown applesauce, or maybe you've made bigger messes in your life. Even that does not separate God from loving you and calling you worthy. When you feel worthless, Jesus would trade his life for yours. Jesus, who is that? What's with the hoopla? People celebrated him. But he was humbling himself to show you that you are worthy of love. Jesus wants to turn the hoopla to you. Not to make yourself an idol. Not to be arrogant, not to be egotistical, not to be self-serving, but Jesus wants you to know that God loves you so much that he's with you and that you don't need to be afraid. And however that, however you can, in whatever way you can, in as many ways as you can, you should then accept that love. 
And when you accept that love, love others in that same way. There's an old saying that says, uh, he who does not love himself cannot love others. One of the first instructions, one of the primary instructions, what Jesus uplifts as the the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then the second, like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love yourself, then you can't love your neighbor. Who is Jesus? What's with the hoopla? We celebrate Jesus. However much you celebrate Jesus, Jesus wants to celebrate you. Not Again, not self-worship, not arrogance, not egotism, not self-service. But know that to love God means to love what God created. And God created you. Who's that? What's with the hoopla? Jesus is the essence of what it means for God to be with us. He's the backup. He's the proof. He's the... He's the everything that says that you are worthy of love. If you don't believe it, He'd trade Himself for you where you feel like you fall short, Jesus says, that's okay. Do better. I'll be with you. In whatever way you're falling short, God says you can do better. And He's with you to help you along the way. Jesus doesn't numb our pains or our griefs. but He helps us get through them by being with us. For children, He doesn't do your homework for you, but He sits with you and calmly and patiently guides you so that you can do it. You can do hard things. And God is with you. We can make it through hard times because God is with us. You can see your loved one again. Because in life and in death, and in life beyond death, God is with us. And that's who Jesus is. Amen.